Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. Welcome to part two of our year-end unearthed from the year 2020. In this episode, we've got art and music and edibles and potables and some exhumations and some repatriations. And as we typically do, we have a collection of finds that don't really relate to each other, but I found them all to be interesting and I have grouped them together as potpourri, and that is where we will start. So this fall, Jesse Sir Philippi at Schuyler Mansion State Historic Site in New York published As Odious and Immoral a Thing, Alexander Hamilton's Hidden History as an Enslaver. So as is clear by that title, this paper upends the popular idea that Hamilton was at heart an abolitionist, or at the very least, he did not personally enslave anyone. Before this point, it was generally agreed that Hamilton had acted as a middleman, arranging transactions for other enslavers, but most of the time he was also characterized as participating in this only with extreme reluctance. Sir Philippi conducted her research through primary source materials, including Hamilton's cash book, where she found individual line items that included income from an enslaved person being hired out to somebody else as well as the cash value of servants tabulated after Hamilton's death. So particularly in the North, the term servant was often used to describe enslaved people. So if you're just doing sort of a straight reading of old documents, it's not always clear when the word servant means a free servant or an enslaved person. However, free servants would not have been included in a property list with a cash value as they were in this case. Sir Philippi's full paper is available online, and it is well worth a read. Here is just a brief tidbit. Quote, A thorough study of the depths of Hamilton's involvement in the institution of slavery has yet to be done through a close examination of Alexander Hamilton's cash books, various letters to and from Hamilton, letters to Elizabeth Schuyler Hamilton from her father, Philip Schuyler, and other related primary accounts. When those sources are fully considered, a rarely acknowledged truth becomes inescapably apparent. Not only did Alexander Hamilton enslave people, but his involvement in the institution of slavery was essential to his identity, both personally and professionally. The denial and obscuration of these facts in nearly every major biography written about him over the past two centuries has erased the people he enslaved from history. It has also created and perpetuated a false and incomplete picture of Hamilton as a man and founding father. Uh, Once again, the title of that paper is As Odious and Immoral a Thing, Alexander Hamilton's Hidden History as an Enslaver. Moving on. This next find was unearthed in September, but it did not hit my radar until October. Crews at the historic Detroit Hotel in St. Petersburg, Florida, found a forgotten elevator, still totally intact except for the cables, along with an abandoned stairwell, a fireplace, and the hotel's original switchboard, this elevator was a particularly serendipitous find because the work that was being done when it was unearthed was to turn the space into a steampunk-themed brew pub and pizzeria. So (laughs) an old cage (laughs) elevator, complete with cranks and gears and whatnot, just fits right into that theme. Perfection. The Detroit Hotel was St. Petersburg's first hotel, and when it was built, it had 40 rooms. That means its capacity was more than the entire population of the town at the time. Uh, In other news, according to research published in the journal Scientific Reports, the Maya city of Tikal had a large-scale water filtration system that used some of the same materials that are part of water filtration systems today. It was a 2,000-year-old filtration system that was built at the Coriental Reservoir, and it used coarse sand, crystalline quartz, and zeolite, which were brought into the area from nearly 20 miles away. And at this point, this is the oldest known zeolite water purification system in the world. 
Since the city was built on top of porous limestone, access to a reservoir was critical to its survival. This combination of minerals in the filtration system would have removed heavy metals, microbes, and nitrogen-rich compounds. Next up, archaeologists working at Stoke Mandeville ahead of the high-speed transportation project HS2 have found what they believe to be witch marks at the Church of St. Mary there. The first structure at the church was built in 1070, and then additions were made to it over the next few hundred years. The finds that have been described as witch marks feature drilled holes that are surrounded with radiating lines. And so the idea with these kinds of marks was that witches or malevolent spirits would get trapped in these lines. Although the same design could have been used as a sundial, the places where these were found make that unlikely. They were not in any right spot or at the right angle for the sun to hit them in any way. But it is possible that they started out as sundials but were then repurposed as part of the building later on. Next up, archaeologists with the project at Colonial Williamsburg have finished the first phase of their work at the Nassau Street location of Williamsburg's First Baptist Church. Enslaved and free Black people first formed this congregation all the way back in 1776. It was one of the first Black churches in the country. They started out meeting at a brush arbor and then in a carriage house before the church building itself was first dedicated in 1856. Then the building was expanded over the years, including an addition in 1893 and an annex in 1953. The 1893 edition had been home to the church's altar and its pulpit, and then the church moved into a totally different building in 1956. In addition to foundations and bricks, the team also found thousands of artifacts that are now being analyzed, along with evidence of two graves. The second phase of excavation work is expected to resume in January and will go on for about 18 months. An organization called the First Baptist Church Nassau Street Descendants formed during this work, and its members include people who worshipped at this historic church or whose parents or grandparents or other ancestors did. So in addition to analyzing its finds from phase one, the archaeological team is also working with the church and this organization on how to plan out the second phase, basically finding out what are your goals also from this work, and how should we approach it from here? This isn't the only work going on in Williamsburg. A multi-year project at property belonging to John Custis IV, father-in-law of Martha Washington, is ongoing and has recently unearthed architectural features and boundary ditches. In other news, Renavalona III, who died in 1917, was the last sovereign of Madagascar, France annexed Madagascar in 1895 and exiled the royal family two years later. One of the employees of the royal family was Clara Herbert, and one of her descendants inherited this box of things like postcards, photographs, receipts, and souvenirs, as well as a pink satin and burgundy cotton velvet gown that belonged to the queen's aunt. On December 8th, Madagascar's government purchased the items at auction for 43,000 pounds British. The government plans to install them in the Queen's Palace for public display. There are some articles online that kind of walk through all the different postcards, sort of how they they piece together the last years uh, of the of the monarch's life. And our last kind of ra- random <laughs> random inclusion in this potpourri. Archaeologists in the Netherlands have discovered an enormous mass grave from the late Middle Ages. And this grave contained the bones of at least 20 people who appear to have been young men between the ages of 15 and 30. And they also found a whole lot of nails suggesting that these uh, people were originally buried in wooden boxes or coffins that had since disintegrated. It's totally unclear at this point how these bodies came to be there or what happened to them, in part because they haven't been conclusively dated yet. But this area used to be the moat of Bodestein Castle, which was built in the 14th century and was largely destroyed by fire at the end of the 17th century. Yeah, the most logical conclusion would probably be that it was an army of some kind, but don't really know yet. Uh, And now we're going to take a quick break before we move on to some other things. (music) 
Our next few unearthings are about art and architecture. And the first one, archaeologists have found tens of thousands of rock paintings on cliff faces in Colombia, South America, in a find that people have dubbed the Sistine Chapel of the Ancients. These paintings are about 12,500 years old, and their subjects include numerous now-extinct animals, including mastodons and giant sloths. There are also handprints, geometric shapes, fish, birds, lizards, turtles, and human figures, some of them so high up that researchers could only get a look at them by using drones. They also found pieces of ochre that may have been used to produce the artwork. Next up, we have a little historical context setting before we talk about the actual find. In 1086, Danish King Knut IV and his brother Benedict were both murdered in Odense, Denmark. At the time, the monarchy and the church were extremely closely connected, and the king had tried to institute a mandatory tithe. Many of the nobility really opposed this plan, and they rose up against him. So he and his whole retinue were murdered in St. Albans Church. And then a few years later, Canute was sanctified, and the church was rededicated as St. Canute's Cathedral in 1300. Canute and his brother were both enshrined in the cathedral, with silk and linen textiles lining both of their shrines. And in the 16th century, in the wake of the Protestant Reformation, the shrines were walled up within the church to hide them. But later on, it was discovered that the king's textiles were missing. In 1874, both shrines were examined in preparation for putting them on display, and Benedict's shrine contained far more valuable textiles. People were like, why were the most beautiful and expensive textiles in the brother's tomb? (laughs) So as people were preparing these shrines for display, they decided to move the best textiles from Benedict's shrine into Canute's shrine so that the king's shrine would look more properly adorned. But that left a lot of really unanswered questions about what had happened to the king's textiles in the first place. Presumably, at some point, they were just stolen. And also, whether his brother's textiles dated back to when they were originally enshrined or whether they were replacements. There's just a lot of stuff that people didn't really know about this, these textiles at this point. Chemical analysis of the remaining textiles has confirmed that they are all the same age and that their age suggests that they really are the original textiles. It is likely that they were imported from southern Italy. Next, we have a thing that, like, I just inexplicably love, and that's that an interdisciplinary team of researchers has been studying the microbiomes of seven drawings by Leonardo da Vinci. When they did this, they expected to find a lot of fungi because it's generally believed that fungi are the dominant microorganism when it comes to art on paper. And since fungus can be really destructive to works of art, there has been a lot of research into these particular organisms. But the researchers were surprised that instead they found a whole lot more bacteria with many of the species of bacteria typical for being part of the human microbiome. So their conclusion is that these bacteria were transferred to the drawings during handling and restoration. And they also identified other bacteria that are more commonly found in the microbiomes of insects. So these may have come from flies and other insects crawling around on or maybe defecating on the artwork. Those disrespectful insects. (laughs) (laughs) There was also a lot of human DNA. Whether any of it belongs to Leonardo da Vinci is not known, but much of it, again, most likely came from all those years of handling. All of this work was completed using a sequencing technology known as nanopore. Last time we did a an unearthed episode, we talked about a mosaic. We have a different mosaic to talk about this time. Archaeologists at Chedworth Roman Villa in Gloucestershire, England, have found the first ever mosaic there that can be dated all the way back to the 5th century. Because mosaic tiles often aren't made from organic material that can be used for carbon-14 dating, they can be kind of hard to conclusively date unless there's other stuff in the area to reference. In this case, they used pieces of charcoal and bone in one of the building's foundation trenches to make that determination. 
The mosaic dates to decades after Britain ceased to be part of the Roman Empire, and it upends some commonly held beliefs about what happened in Britain at that point. It has long been assumed that Britain faced an enormous economic collapse and that most of the villas and towns that had been associated with the empire were immediately abandoned and fell into disrepair. While the mosaic itself is of somewhat poorer quality than ones created during the Roman era, its existence also suggests that works like this were still being created. So that economic shift was less immediate and less linear. In the words of Martin Papworth, the National Trust archaeologist, quote, it has generally been believed that most of the population turned to subsistence farming to sustain themselves, and after the break with Rome, Britannia's administrative system broke down into a series of local fiefdoms. What is so exciting about the dating of this mosaic at Chedworth is that it is evidence for a more gradual decline. The creation of a new room and the laying of a new floor suggests wealth, and a mosaic industry continuing 50 years later than had been expected. Okay, this next one is not about art or architecture, but it is connected to the same period that we just discussed. In 2018, two metal detectorists, Sue and Mick Washington, found a pair of bronze bowls in Buckinghamshire, England, and alerted the Portable Antiquities Scheme, which is a project that records archaeological finds made by members of the public. An excavation followed that unearthed a bronze vessel, iron spearheads, and a grave. So this grave was excavated in August, and the findings were announced in October. The person buried there was very tall for the time, and the items buried with him included a sword, a very well-preserved scabbard, spears, bronze and glass vessels, and fittings and decorative elements. So this person has been nicknamed the Marlowe Warlord, and the remains date back to the 6th century. Like the mosaic that we just talked about, this burial site has offered up some new information about the region after the Roman era. In the words of Dr. Gabor Thomas, quote, what we found exceeded all our expectations and provides new insights into this stretch of the Thames in the decades after the collapse of the Roman administration in Britain. So the nature of the burial suggests that it was someone of importance, the first such burial to be found in the Mid-Thames Basin rather than the Upper Thames or London. The Mid-Thames was believed to be a border area, resting in between powerful tribal groups, but this suggests that it had powerful residents of its own. Now we are going to move on to the edibles and the potables, and sadly to me... We don't have many actual edibles and potables this time around, as in things that you could physically eat or drink should you choose to, which we definitely do not advise doing. There's no bog butter. (laughs) No, don't eat the bog butter. We only have one thing that you could put in your mouth, which again, do not. These are some 120-year-old chocolates that belonged to Australian poet and war correspondent Banjo Patterson, which had been commissioned by Queen Victoria to provide a morale boost to soldiers during the Boer War. The chocolates were in a souvenir tin, packed in straw and wrapped in silver foil. And they turned up by surprise in a collection of Patterson's newspaper clippings and personal papers. That was like, there's there's chocolates in here. (laughs) Here's some records and a snack. I thought this was all pictures and papers and stuff. Um... So although that was our only theoretically actual edible object, we do have some research into what various people in the past ate or where they ate. A thermopolium or a hot food kiosk has been unearthed in Pompeii. Work around this kiosk started a couple of years ago, but as of December of 2020, it has now been completely unearthed. Oh boy, has this been a hot subject at our house. Yeah, I really think this replaced the monolith in terms of the things people (laughs) talk. This one's been so popular. Like, periodically, I'll be, during the holiday break, I would be like in my sewing room or something, just puttering around. And all of a sudden, my husband would zoom into the room and tell me the latest thing he had read. He's very worried about the dogs. Um, (laughs) 
The Thermopolium was basically a fast food eatery, selling hot foods from vessels that rested in holes in the top of the counter. It's also decorated, including pictures of mallards and a rooster, which may have advertised the kind of food served there, in addition to just being very pretty. There is also a nymph riding a seahorse, which is probably not meant to be a menu item. And like many other parts of Pompeii, it had been scrawled with graffiti. Yes, and Holly also just referenced there were dog bones. Well, there's a picture of a dog on oh, a leash. Oh, there's a picture of a dog on a leash. I thought there was, oh, I think there's a, there was a set, there were some sets of remains in the area, and it was one of those things of like, we don't actually, was, it, was it the proprietor? Was it a customer? Was it a random passerby? Yeah. There is a picture of a dog on a leash. I forgot about that part. Yeah, and uh, we were discussing, and many people online have been discussing, does that mean that they served dog as one of their things? Well, they also have this mermaid situation I think there was, I'm completely talking off the top of my head at this point, but I think there was a similar image of a dog on a leash found somewhere else that suggested m- more that they were, um, like, pets than than something that would be on the menu. Oh, sure. But I don't know if that's just modern humans trying to negotiate with the past in a way that makes it palatable. Yeah, or maybe maybe, maybe they have treats for your dog. Maybe. <laughs> Is hot food for you? And, and your puppy. And Scruffy. Yeah. Uh, anyway, other finds that were in this uh, area included a ladle and amphorae and an oil container and some flasks. Lots of things that you might expect to find at an eatery of some sort. Archaeologists have used the residues in dental tartar to study what people in the Levant were eating 3,700 years ago. And they found evidence that at least some people's diets included turmeric, bananas, and soy, suggesting that these foods were being traded from South and East Asia much earlier than people previously thought. Yeah, like the fact that people had these residues in their teeth does suggest that maybe this uh, trade was already well established, but they did also only find evidence of these specific foods in some of the remains they studied and not all of them. So it's possible there were class distinctions involved, just very different dietary tastes. Also, another possible explanation is that these particular people were travelers from Asia who had traveled into the area carrying the evidence of what they used to eat from their earlier life with them. So that's a little interesting, but not totally clear yet. Next up, research published in the Journal of Archaeological Science has examined the diets of people in the Indus Valley civilization through lipid residues on pottery. And some of these findings were surprising. They found a lot of residues from non-ruminant animals, like pigs, far more than would be suggested by the volume of pig remains at Indus Valley settlements. There's also evidence of a lot of dairy animals at these sites, but not as much evidence of the use of dairy in the lipid residues. The reasons for these disparities, completely unclear at this time. We're still figuring it out. Yeah. Uh, To move on, the paper, The Prehistoric Roots of Chinese Cuisines, Mapping Staple Food Systems of China, 6000 BC to 220 AD, which was published in November, studied 2,448 human skeletal samples from 128 different archaeological sites across China, They used isotopic indicators to figure out what these people had eaten. The remains covered a span of 6,000 years, and the team found that prior to 2000 BCE, food staples in China were differentiated between people in the north and the south, generally speaking. But then after that point, the differences were more between the east and the west. In the words of their press release, quote, they argue that the early north-south divide was driven by environmental differences that favored different plant resources in wetland versus arid regions, while the later east-west division was driven by differences in cultural practice, with eastern cooking habits of boiling and steaming less suited to adopting new cereals like wheat and barley. So according to this research, about 8,000 years ago, people in northern China ate millet, but people in southern China were more likely to eat nuts, tubers, fruits, and rice. That was just the sorts of things that grew best there. But later on, as other grains were introduced in China, preferences started shifting along this more of an east-west pattern related to how people prepared the food, since the which foods grew best was not as much of an issue anymore. 
In Eastern Asia, it became more common to boil and steam grains, while in West Asia, it was more common to grind those grains into flour. So when wheat and barley were introduced, they were more readily adapted in places where people were already used to grinding grains into flour. And our last food find before we take a break. Archaeologists in Leiden, Netherlands, have unearthed the ruins of a fort that was used during the Eighty Years' War. And this fort has a connection to local food lore. As the story goes, during the Siege of Leiden in 1574, Spanish troops fled the fort, and they left behind a pot of simmering stew. Cornelis Japenzoon found this stew, which had been made from parsnips and carrots, and then carried it out to the beggars who had been helping in the defense against the Spanish. Today, the Dutch stew called hutspud, which is made from carrots, onions, and potatoes, which are boiled and mashed, is traditionally served on October 3rd in reference to all of this. Some of the finds of the fort include part of a moat, as well as pewter utensils, drinking vessels, pottery, and fishing line. Now we will take one more quick ad break and before we move on to some musical finds. We have a couple of finds related to music. And the first is a pair of wax cylinders suggest that the music industry in Los Angeles got its start earlier than previously believed. Music collector John Levin bought these cylinders, which were part of a box of other assorted items. One of the cylinders contains a recording of the song Yankee Doodle, which is, quote, played by Mr. Fred Kimball for the Los Angeles Phonograph Company of Los Angeles, California. That part of the recording. Before this point, the first recording label in the area was believed to be Nordskog Records, established in Santa Monica in 1921. But written references to a Los Angeles phonograph parlors goes back to 1893. It was already known that they sold and promoted phonographs, but this is the first evidence that they may have also made and distributed recordings. This is all still a little tenuous, though. Wax cylinders are easy to fake, and these were unmarked. Yeah, I'm certainly not accusing this collector of faking anything. (laughs) This really can be very difficult to conclusively determine when and where they came from. Uh, Our other musical find is a missing song, kind of, from the Muppet Christmas Carol, which has now been rediscovered again, kind of. This song was called When Love Is Gone, and it was cut from the film's cinematic release out of concerns that it wouldn't appeal to young viewers. It was something that director Brian Henson agreed to only if the song would be included for television broadcast and home theater release. So when The Muppet Christmas Carol came out on VHS, the song was still in there. But years later, when the DVD release of the movie was being prepared, the original master that included When Love Is Gone was missing. So the DVD version had to go out without the song as part of the film itself. But in more recent months, when the film was being remastered for 4K, they found an old copy. So it is back. Uh, I was uh, intending over the break to get my DVD copy of The Muppet Christmas Carol and because I think it's like one of the extras to the audio of the song. I did not confirm that. (laughs) (laughs) Stuff that I meant to do over break and did not do. Now we will move on to some exhumations, some of which are also updates. Last time on Unearthed we talked about an effort to exhume the body of President Warren G. Harding to confirm the ancestry of his grandson, James Blessing. Something that no one was really questioning at this point. (laughs) In December, a Marion County family court judge in Ohio denied this request for the exhumation, citing earlier letters as evidence that the Harding family has already accepted Blessing as their relative, so it's not needed. In another exhumation, a massive exhumation project is underway in England, in that old gym ahead of highway work. Uh, Remains of an estimated 19,000 people need to be relocated in Trinity Burial Ground in Hull. They would be moved to a different part of the same burial ground, just out of the way of the construction. So a huge tent has been erected over the site for this work. And then because of the pandemic, archaeologists who are working on the project are observing social distancing while they do all this whole thing. 
at least 85 different archaeologists are expected to be part of this work. It is a massive exhumation and reburial project. Next, we're talking about an exhumation that is not new, but the details on Roger Casement's exhumation in 1965 have been released as part of an ongoing project to release official documents related to Irish foreign policy. This project is a joint effort of the Royal Irish Academy, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and the National Archives of Ireland. Its 12th volume of documents covers the years 1961 to 1965, and that was released in November of 2020. Diplomat Paul Keating observed the exhumation and wrote a memo about it, which is in this collection. His account begins, quote, two teams of prison officials dug steadily, and at about 7.30 were surprised to come across a layer of lime. Immediately below it was a very thick mud and water. Floating on top of it, there appeared two small black objects, which on examination by a doctor turned out to be two bones of the thumb. From there, he describes the site being so waterlogged that they had to send for a pump. But he also expresses some confidence that they were able to retrieve all of the bones that could have survived both the lime and the decades of being in this waterlogged grave. After this exhumation, Casement's remains were returned to Ireland and reburied. Prior hosts of the show did an episode on Casement in 2012. We also have a few repatriations and returns to talk about this time. In 2002, Pat Patterson bought a Korean painting at an estate sale. The workers who were arranging the sale had found the painting behind a dresser between pieces of cardboard, and it was accompanied by a letter saying it had been painted by Kim Hong-do with calligraphy done by Kang Se-hwang. Patterson did years of work to figure out where the painting had come from, eventually tracing it to Eugene Kuhn, who had bought it in 1953 while he was serving in the Korean War. In November, Patterson returned it to the Danwon Art Museum in South Korea, which is in Kang Se Hwang's hometown. Uh, next up, in October, the Dutch Council for Culture announced a recommendation that Dutch museums return any items that were taken from their countries of origin during the Dutch colonial era if there's reasonable certainty that these items were taken by force. So this generally spans the whole period between the early 17th century and 1975. And this direction could apply to as many as 100,000 items that are currently in museum collections. Although this recommendation specifically applied to places where the Netherlands had colonies, the Council also recommended that museums take another look at objects that came from other parts of the world, especially if those objects could have some kind of religious, cultural, or historic importance. So the Dutch museum community seems to have been generally receptive to these recommendations, at least based on what I've read. But when it comes to culturally important items that were not stolen, the idea of returning them continues to be a much more contentious subject. Next up, a horse head sculpture, which was one of 12 animal head sculptures stolen from China during the Second Opium War, has now been returned. British and French troops looted China's Old Summer Palace in 1860. Before that point, the bronze horse head had been one of the Chinese zodiac sculptures that topped a water clock in the royal garden. This piece actually made its way to China in 2019. And at this point, eight of the 12 sculptures have been found and returned. But this horse head is the only one to then be restored and put on display in its original home in Beijing. And that is the part of this that happened Uh, in 2020. Four Toi Moko, which are preserved tattooed Maori heads, were returned to New Zealand in October. After their courier spent two weeks in quarantine because of the COVID-19 pandemic, they were taken to the Te Papa Museum, where they were greeted with a Maori welcoming ceremony. So these are ancestors, and all four of them had been held in collections in Germany, two of them at the Berlin Ethnological Museum and two at Göttingen University. And these are four of at least 800 that were removed from New Zealand between 1770 and 1840. About 600 of them have been returned through the museum's repatriation program. At this point, it is not yet known exactly whose ancestors these four Toimoko are. So they are being held at the museum while further research is done. And now we are coming to the end of our Unearthed for the end of 2020. And uh, once again, we don't have any new Utsi news. We are going to end on something that's kind of connected. 
5,000-year-old skeletal remains buried in a squatting position were discovered in Germany in May. This find has been nicknamed the Lady of Bietikau, and she lived at about the same time as Utzi the Iceman, whose well-preserved remains were discovered on the border of Austria and Italy in 1991. In November, the team working with these remains announced some of the findings from their work. She was between 30 and 45 years old at the time of her death, and her teeth show an enormous amount of wear, some to the point of being missing entirely, which may have been caused by the presence of a lot of tough grains in her diet. Although serious dental problems can be life-threatening, it's not yet clear whether this contributed to her cause of death. So, that is our year-end unearthed for the year 2020. <laughs> Uh, which I don't know. This, these are fun to pull together. Yeah. Uh, but it was it was weird to have a lengthy break between when I put a bunch of stuff into the document and when I finished it <laughs> after <laughs> returning to work after the holidays. Uh, how do you feel about listener mail after returning to work after the holidays? Well, uh, as as we said on Monday's episode, there's a lot of it to still read. Uh, I have one from Daniel. Daniel wrote in to say, I was recently listening to your O. Henry episode, and you mentioned O. Henry bars as unclear in origin. Here where I live in Kansas, there's a small town called Dexter. Dexter lays claim to two small pieces of national history. There is a small park with an oil well that never struck oil, but instead a natural gas that did not burn. It turned out to be the first helium well. The second is a small metal building called Henry's Candy Company. Henry's handmakes candy to this day. They have large glass viewing walls where you can watch. They claim the original O. Henry bar was made by them in 1919. They sell their own O. Henry, Mama Henry, and Baby Henry bars and hard candies they make themselves as well as bulk packaged candy. Thanks for your work. You are one of my go-to podcasts, one of the few podcasts I've found that I don't have to worry about my three-year-old overhearing due to language. And since you seem to like animals, I attached a picture of Flynn Ryder, uh, my daughter's nine-month-old cat that seems to prefer the parents over the children. Sigh, Daniel. Um, one, I love the name Flynn Rider for a cat. There may not be a better moniker. Um, two, that'll change as the kids get older. Cats like to be able to control their approach, and adults are not as likely to be unpredictable and grabby. That's all it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so thank you so much for that letter and for those great pictures. If you would like to write to us about this or any other podcast, we're at History Podcast at iHeartRadio.com. We are also all over social media at Miss in History. That's where you'll find our Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts and the iHeartRadio app and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. <laughs> 